Mauritius was once ruled by giants, tortoises, dodos, and skinks, whose disappearance shattered ancient forests. By 2007, over 3,000 adult ebony trees stood stranded, but almost none of their seeds survived. Faced with ecological collapse, conservationists made a radical move. They released 30 giant tortoises as proxies for species lost centuries ago. 25 years later, has this audacious experiment restored a broken world or created a new one entirely? The answer begins with a vanished paradise. Before ships ever anchored off its shores, Mauritius thrived as an island of giants. Two species of giant tortoises, Celandraspis inepta and Celandraspis tricerata, lumbered across the forests and rocky clearings. Their domed shells rose above the undergrowth, their slow movements shaping the land itself. These tortoises grazed on tough grasses, browsed shrubs, and devoured the large, fleshy fruits that fell from ancient trees. As they moved, seeds passed through their guts and scattered across the island, each dung pile a tiny nursery for new life. The forests echoed with other heavy-footed neighbors. The dodo, a flightless bird nearly a meter tall, feasted on fallen fruits and seeds, swallowing them whole and carrying them far from the parent trees. Giant skinks, longer than a man's arm, hunted and foraged alongside them, while fruit bats with wingspans stretching over half a meter soared above, pollinating flowers and spreading seeds between distant groves. This community of large animals drove the cycles that kept the forests alive. Trees like the ebony, with their thick canopies and heavy fruits, depended on these giants to move their seeds into sunlight and open ground. Palms, wild olives, and syzygium trees relied on animal partners to escape the shadow of their parents. The tortoises trampled down dense thickets, opening gaps for seedlings to take root. As they grazed, browsed, and wallowed, they shaped the very structure of the island's habitats. Every year rains would bring a flush of new growth, Tortoises and dodos alike followed the fruiting trees, their trails carving through the undergrowth. Seedlings sprouted in their wake, some carried in dung, others dropped from beaks or jaws. The result was a living mosaic, old growth forest, palm dotted clearings and open glades, all maintained by the steady work of these giant gardeners. For thousands of years, this network of interactions held steady. The forests of Mauritius were not static, but pulsed with life, constantly renewed by the passage of their largest inhabitants. Each species played its part, tortoise, dodo, skink, and bat, woven together in a system that had no parallel anywhere else on Earth. The balance was delicate, but it endured, untouched and unbroken, until the arrival of people. By the late 20th century, the forests of Mauritius bore scars that ran deeper than the loss of giant animals. On Ile aux Aigrettes, the once dense ebony stands had been hammered by decades of logging. Chainsaws and axes cleared huge swaths for firewood through the 1970s and into the early 1980s. What remained was a patchwork of mature ebony trees, tall, gnarled, and silent, standing in isolation across the battered landscape. In 2007, researchers set out to measure what was left. They counted thousands of adult ebony trees scattered across the island. But beneath those living pillars, the ground told a different story. In the northern and eastern sectors, where logging had hit hardest, saplings were almost entirely missing. The next generation of ebony was absent. Fallen fruits collected in thick mats under parent trees left to rot. Without the giant tortoises that once carried seeds far and wide, dispersal had collapsed. The forest's renewal machinery had ground to a halt. Everywhere they looked, scientists found the same pattern. In the shade of mature trees, a handful of seedlings would sometimes sprout, but these young plants rarely survived. Crowded together and trapped in the shadow of their parents, they faced relentless competition for sunlight and nutrients. Fungal pathogens, thriving in the damp, fruit-littered soil, cut down most before they reached knee height. Even the luckiest rarely escaped the dense thickets under old canopies. The open clearings, once trampled and seeded by tortoises, remained barren. No young ebonies ventured out into the light. Other large fruited species suffered similar fates. Palms and syzygium trees, their seeds too big for birds or wind to move, could not spread beyond the reach of their own branches. 
The disappearance of animal dispersers had left these trees stranded, unable to recolonize the open ground left by logging. The island's plant life was aging in place, locked in a slow motion collapse. This was not just a loss of trees, it was the unraveling of an entire system. Without new recruits, the old giants would eventually fall, one by one, with nothing to take their place. The forests that had once pulsed with renewal now faced a quiet, inevitable decline. The evidence was stark, the numbers unambiguous. Thousands of adult ebonies, but almost no saplings in the places that needed them most. The mechanisms that once sustained these forests had vanished, and time alone was not enough to bring them back. The urgency for intervention grew with every passing year, as the living relics of Mauritius's past stood surrounded by emptiness, unable to ensure their own future. Restoration teams tried everything they could to bring the forest back. Workers spent countless hours collecting ebony seeds by hand, sowing them in open patches left by logging. The process was slow, expensive, and frustrating. Without the journey through an animal's gut, most seeds failed to sprout at all. Those that did often produced weak seedlings, struggling in poor soil and exposed to the same fungal threats that plagued natural saplings under their parent trees. To protect what remained, conservationists built fences around mature trees hoping to shield them from hungry deer and other introduced grazers. Fencing kept the adults safe, but it did not solve the bigger problem. Young trees still clustered beneath parent canopies, unable to escape the shadow and compete for light. The forest's next generation remained trapped, with almost no recruits venturing into the clearings where new growth was desperately needed. Some hoped that time would heal the wounds. After logging stopped in the early 1980s, they waited for nature to recover on its own. Decades passed, but the open ground stayed bare. The missing dispersers had left a gap that nothing else could fill. Even attempts to introduce fruit-eating birds failed. None of the surviving species could handle the large, tough fruits that ebony and palms produced. Every conventional tool fell short, leaving the forest locked in stasis and the restoration teams searching for answers. In the 1990s, a new idea began to circulate among conservation biologists. What if the problem was not just the loss of species, but the disappearance of the roles they played. The traditional approach, protect what remains and replant what is missing, had run up against a wall on islands like Mauritius where the main actors were gone for good. The forests, stripped of their ancient gardeners, could not recover on their own. Some ecologists argued for a radical step, bring in close relatives from elsewhere to fill the empty niches. This was the theory of taxon substitution. The proposal drew sharp lines in the conservation community. Supporters pointed out that the extinctions on Mauritius were recent in evolutionary terms, just centuries ago, not millennia, and that suitable proxies still existed. Aldebra giant tortoises, for example, were nearly identical in size and diet to the lost Mauritian species and came from similar Indian Ocean islands. If the goal was to restore ecosystem function, not just preserve a museum of survivors, then introducing such close analogs could restart the cycles of seed dispersal and regeneration. Opponents remembered the havoc caused by past introductions, rats, pigs, and invasive plants that overwhelmed island ecosystems. They warned that even well-matched proxies might behave unpredictably or bring new problems. The ethical calculus was fraught. Was it better to risk new invasions or to let unique forests slide into oblivion? The debate grew heated in policy meetings and field stations. Yet the urgency was clear. With forests aging in place and no natural recovery in sight, some argued that inaction was the greater gamble. The stage was set for a conservation experiment that would test the boundaries of what could and should be done to save a vanishing world. In the late 1990s, conservationists from the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation set out to do what had never been tried before on Mauritius bring in living proxies for the island's long-lost giants. The first Aldebra giant tortoises arrived on Round Island, a remote outpost north of the main island, where decades of invasive species control had cleared the way for a bold experiment. Over the next several years, small groups of tortoises were introduced, their progress tracked by field staff who marked and monitored each animal. By 2024, the Round Island population had reached around 700 individuals a number carefully managed to balance the needs of the ecosystem with the space available. 
On Elo Segrets, the strategy was more cautious. The first batch of Aldabra tortoises arrived in March 2000, unloaded from crates by staff and volunteers after a journey from the Seychelles. The founding group numbered just a handful, between 4 and 20 individuals, depending on the year's arrivals. The goal was not to flood the island, but to test whether these newcomers could survive, feed, and move seeds the, as their extinct relatives once had. Every tortoise was tagged and measured, its health checked by veterinarians before release. As the years passed, the population grew through a combination of new arrivals and successful breeding. Juvenile tortoises hatched on the island faced their own challenges. To give them the best chance, conservationists used a head-starting program. Eggs and hatchlings were collected from nests, then raised in protected enclosures until they were large enough to avoid predation and survive on their own. Only then were they released into the wild. This approach, borrowed from other island restoration projects, helped build a stable, self-sustaining population. By 2024, about 30 Aldebra tortoises roamed Il Ozegret, each one a living experiment in ecological substitution. Managing these populations required constant attention. Staff conducted regular surveys, checked fence lines, and monitored breeding success. On both islands, the number of tortoises was kept within strict limits to avoid overgrazing and to ensure the animals could play their intended role as seed dispersers without overwhelming the delicate habitats. The logistical effort was significant, but the payoff was clear. For the first time in centuries, giant tortoises once again shaped the land and its plants, not as relics of the past, but as active agents of restoration. In 2011, the results of the tortoise experiment landed in the scientific record. Christine Griffiths and her team published the first hard evidence that giant tortoises weren't just surviving, they were restoring a lost ecological function. Their study tracked the fate of ebony seeds on Il Ozegret, comparing those that passed through a tortoise's gut to those that fell and rotted beneath parent trees. The difference was striking. Seeds carried and excreted by tortoises were far more likely to germinate, breaking free from the dense mats of fruit and fungal pathogens that had doomed earlier generations. Field surveys revealed a wave of new life in places that had stood empty for decades. In the log northern and eastern sectors, where researchers once found thousands of adult ebony trees but almost no saplings, young ebonies now took root far from their parents. The tortoises, by wandering and feeding, had scattered seeds into open patches, places where sunlight, space, and the absence of fungal buildup gave seedlings a real chance to grow. For the first time in over a century, ebony forests began to regenerate on their own. The story played out even more dramatically with the Latania laudigesi palm. Before the tortoises, young palms were rare and clustered tightly around mature trees. After rewilding, clusters of palm seedlings appeared in clearings, well away from the shadow of their parents. The pattern matched the tortoises' movements exactly, confirming that these animals were acting as the primary dispersers. On Round Island, palm-rich habitat expanded into areas once considered lost, driven by the daily routines of these slow-moving gardeners. The numbers told a clear story. Gut past seeds germinated at higher rates, and saplings established where no human planting effort had succeeded. The forests were no longer aging in place, they were recruiting a new generation, powered by a restored partnership between plant and animal. For restoration ecologists, this was more than a hopeful sign. It was proof that function, not just form, could be revived, even after centuries of silence. Not every consequence of the tortoise rewilding has been welcome. In areas where Aldabra tortoises roam, the non-native herb Desmodium and Canum has surged, thriving in disturbed ground and resisting heavy grazing far better than most native plants. Fecal analysis shows clearly that tortoises eat Desmodium pods and disperse its seeds across the landscape just as they do with native palms and ebony. Over time, this has shifted the ground cover. Native herbs and creepers have declined in some zones, replaced by dense mats of desmodium that can outcompete local seedlings. Some field ecologists argue that desmodium's spread now complicates restoration, potentially limiting the recovery of rare endemics. Others note it may help stabilize soil in open areas. Either way, the evidence is clear. Proxy species can revive lost functions, but they may also carry new ecological baggage, 
forcing managers to weigh trade-offs that were not part of the original plan. On Ile Oz Egret, school groups gather around tortoise pens while guides explain how these living giants help forests recover. The project's popularity has turned the island into a conservation classroom, attracting thousands of visitors each year and boosting support for local science. The ripple effect stretches far beyond Mauritius. In Madagascar, Aldebra tortoises released as stand-ins for extinct species produced wild hatchlings by 2020 and uh, the first in centuries. In Hawaii, African spurred tortoises are now being trialed as seed dispersers for endangered plants. Policymakers and restoration groups cite the Mauritius experiment in reports and proposals, weighing its lessons and its warnings. As more places look for ways to repair damaged ecosystems, the story of these tortoises offers both inspiration and a reminder. Every introduction carries consequences, and every success is watched around the world. Today, Mauritius's forests grow under the watch of surrogate giants, proving that sometimes restoring lost functions matters more than restoring lost species. As extinction accelerates, this experiment forces us to ask, is a living, imperfect ecosystem better than a museum of ghosts? The answers we forge now will decide whether tomorrow's wild places are relics or resilient, evolving worlds.